and welcome to the Vibe of the Tribe podcast from JewishBoston.com. I'm Miriam Anzevin, and I'm joined on this episode by my co-host, Dan Seligson. Hi there, Dan. Hi, Miriam. We need to talk about a very important issue that has been on the minds of many of us here in greater Boston and our Jewish community, especially given the events of the past few weeks. Anti-Semitism has never gone away. But it sure seems like it's much more common than any point in my lifetime. It's difficult, it's frightening, it's exhausting, and frankly, it's pissing me off. That's right, Dan. We're channeling our anger into what promises to be a productive and informative conversation with our guest, Dr. Rachel Fish, an expert in the history and context of Jew hatred in America and around the world. Dr. Fish most recently was the founding executive director of the Foundation to Combat Antisemitism. Uh, Dr. Rachel Fish, thank you so much for joining us today on the Vibe of the Tribe podcast. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Dan, for having me. We had planned to do an episode this summer on the topic of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred in Boston, America, and worldwide. Between the time we initially invited you to come talk to us on the podcast and today, an event took place that was quite demonstrative of the immediacy of this topic. On July 1st, local Rabbi Shlomo Naginsky was stabbed multiple times outside of a Jewish day school in Brighton. The news hit everyone in the community really hard. How did it affect you personally? You know, Miriam, I think everyone feels some ability to remain protected, secure, and insular. And so when you see a hate crime targeting your own community, literally in the neighborhood next to you, you realize that this isn't something happening across the oceans. This isn't just happening in cities like New York, but this is actually permeating multiple layers of society, multiple ethnic communities, and that you cannot escape the fear and also the targeting that many are focused on against Jews at this point in time. So it's, it's here and we can't escape it. And my response to that is you need to be aware of it, be wide eyed about it and not naive. You cannot be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand. And you have to think very clearly about how to address it. The suspect in the case was charged with a hate crime. And this came on the heels of a dual murder in Winthrop of a black man, David Green, and a black woman, Ramona Cooper, by a man who espoused racist views and Jew hatred. Where do these incidents fit in the context of extremism and anti-Jewish animus here in Boston? So, Dan, I think what's important to recognize is that we know hate exists against many communities, many marginal voices, and it targets a variety of populations. We also know that when othering and dehumanization takes place, that no one particular group is exempt from that potential hate. And that's where you can see a real foundation that exists among the roots of hatred. Now, each form of hatred has its own particularisms. So if you're targeting Black people and people of color, you see a particular form of hate often in the form of racism and then violence towards people of color. There has always been, in the case of racism, an assumption that people of color are inferior to those individuals who are white. And so it's an inferiority that one is trying to continue to oppress and suppress those individuals of color. And that's where you get the history of slavery, the Jim Crow laws, and you can see the legacy of that to this day within many institutions within America. And that also plays out, of course, within grassroots individual actions. Anti-Semitism has its own unique characteristics. Yes, similar forms of the othering, the dehumanization, and the demonization. But in terms of anti-Semitism, it has really transformed over time. And that transformation over time targeted Jews because of their religious identification, their belief system. Then it mutated to attack and target Jews because of their perceived racial identity, targeting Jews because they are a particular people. 
and not Aryan enough, not purely ethnically German enough, as we saw during the rise of Nazism. And now we see also the targeting of Jews because of Israel as a nation state that identifies as a Jewish and democratic nation state. And what is playing out is that very often Jews as a collective are perceived to be held responsible for Israeli behavior and Israeli action. So each of these forms doesn't replace one another. They just, it's a continuum and they continue to exist. What we know and what history has shown us is that when Jews are targeted, it never ends with the Jews. And in this case, it's not because Jews are perceived as inferior, but rather because Jews often take the form of the anti-Semitic imagination of what other, whatever needs to be addressed within the challenges of a society. So for example, right, Henry Ford thought that Jews controlled the global economy. So that's a problem. But we also know that from the Soviet Union, Jews are perceived to be capitalists. But we know from other societies, Jews are supposedly the subversive socialists. So Jews are always what of whatever is needed by the anti-Semitic imagination in order to scapegoat and point a finger to. So when we see Jew hatred, we have to know that, and, and the larger community, the non-Jewish community has to know that this is not going to end with the Jews. It is going to spill over into other communities because there is now a license, credence given to targeting hating and fomenting violence. Yeah, we're going to uh, dive into the Israel question in some more depth later, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about the word anti-Semitism itself. It was coined by Wilhelm Marr, a person who hated Jews, obviously. Uh, in the past few years, many media outlets made the decision to drop the hyphen between anti and Semite or Semitism because it distorts its meaning and potency. But why are we even using this term to begin with instead of just saying Jew hatred, which is more accurate? And what can we do to help people understand what the term anti-Semitism means? Because the word and its origin itself is complicated. So it's a great question, Dan. I'm actually going to step back even a little bit historically, because before Wilhelm Marr coins the term anti-Semitumus, which becomes anti-Semitism, the term that was used in Germany was Judenhass, Jew hate. And Judenhass was viewed as being crass. So Wilhelm Marr wanted to, quote unquote, sanitize the word. Now, what is a Semite? And we have to understand what a Semite is. The Semitic region is a geographical location and what we refer to as the Levant, which is what we would call the modern day Mediterranean region. And the peoples who lived in this geographical location shared similar ethnic composition and shared linguistic roots. Think about Arabic and Hebrew and Phoenician and Akkadian, these kinds of languages that have the same sort of root systems. In the 19th century, Jews are often referred by Europeans as being Easterners, Orientals, and Semites. Arabs, even though they come from that part of the territory as well, that Levant, they are not often referred to in these European texts as Semites. It's a, it's a term that is located for Jews. Because of that, Wilhelm Marr says, look, this Jew hate, it sounds ugly. Let's call it anti-Semitism. We're against the Semitic people. The Semitic people in this case are the Jews. And that's where you get the term. And it's hyphenated at that point in time. And there's been a whole debate about whether you hyphenate it, whether you capitalize the A or not. And ultimately what has been decided is that you lose the capital A, you get rid of the hyphen because it is one idea hating Jews. It's not, you know, anything other than that. Now to your point, Dan, what's really important is that we know from survey research that the majority of Americans 
Americans, particularly millennials and Gen Zers, do not know what the term anti-Semitism means. I can tell you we conducted research of 13 to 35-year-olds and asked them, what is anti-Semitism? The majority of them, demographically representative across America, said IDK. I don't know. Some of them said, what's a Semite? Because that's not a term that's in our vernacular. And we also got responses like, I'm anti-racist. I'm anti-homophobic. I'm anti-Islamophobic. So I'm probably an anti-Semite. And you're thinking, no, 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 you're an anti-anti-Semite. Because the way we understand anti is different, right, than the way they understand this term. So I have been pushing, Dan, to your point that we need to say either Jew hatred or hatred of Jews. And the reason is, is because it is much clearer, particularly to young people, but not only, exactly who is being targeted and for what purpose. Now, we find among older individuals that if you say Jew hatred, they feel very uncomfortable. And very Good. often, exactly, exactly, because <laughs> very it's often, uncomfortable concept. that's right. And very often they say, well, that's crass. And yes, it's crass because it is a crass form of hatred. So I do think Jew hatred or hatred of Jews is the kind of phrasing we need to be using because the majority of this country doesn't even know what anti-Semitism is. The other thing I'll just say very quickly about that is if they do know what anti-Semitism is, it is usually their understanding of targeting Jews because of only their religion. And if you expand it, I think, to hatred of Jews, then you get a better understanding that it can take these different permutations. It, it's interesting. I just, you know, I'm reflecting for a second on, on the word Jew, which uh, a lot of non-Jews consider to be uh, a term that makes them nervous. They, they would like to say, anti-Jewish or Jewish. I don't know. They, they like to use Jewish instead of Jew. Yes. Um, I'm just kind of wondering how we, how we also overcome that hang up, which I don't know if it should be a hang up, but, but it is. It is. And I don't know the answer to that. And, and Jew is not a value statement as a term, right? It's identifying the definition. Exactly. Yeah. So and, and I think part of that is um, just helping people familiarize themselves more with, you know, who Jews are and the stripes and colors Jews come in. Remember, much of the world is not Boston. And so, you know, most most Americans don't even interact with Jews. Right. I mean, I grew up in a small town in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. And I remember, you know, folks would want to touch my head to feel if I had horns. The horns? And these aren't people who hated Jews, but they literally have no exposure to Jews, the Jewish community, the complexity of Judaism at all. A lot of people that we've been talking to recently have been saying that things do feel different now in a worse sense. Uh, maybe over the past five years. What has been shifting? What do statistics and anecdotes tell us about reality versus perception of anti-Jew hatred? So I believe, Miriam, and we can double check for sure, but I believe, you know, like FBI hate crimes recently said that 60% of targeted religious hate crimes have been against Jews just in this past year. And again, remember, we're 2% of the population. Now, here's where it's tricky because we don't want them only understood as religious because it's not just the Jew who dressed a certain way or just an incident against someone who's walking to a synagogue or vandalism you know, against the synagogue. And so part of the challenge here is also broadening even the FBI's understanding of what these forms of hate towards Jews look like and how it's not just about religion. A lot has changed. We are living in a world right now in which we are looking for emotional, simplistic responses. We live in a world where too many people get quote unquote information from these devices that is curated by business algorithms that actually only give you a very narrow 
perspective or understanding. We live in a world right now in which many individuals actually forego their critical thinking skills when they're on these devices. They stop asking themselves, who's writing this? What facts are used? What narratives are being constructed? Is there a call to action? Because so-and-so posted it. And so therefore it must be okay. And what happens is, is these silos are actually reinforcing divisiveness within our societies. And we have actually forgotten what it means to be in relation and deep relationship and respectful relationships with people who have opposing perspectives. And I think that actually has created a huge challenge for us to overcome because when you actually don't spend time socializing or intellectually engaging with people who hold different perspectives, who look different than you, who have different historical experiences, you actually start to see the atrophy of the muscle of compassion. And you actually see the atrophy of the muscle of empathy. And we have to find a way to rebuild and strengthen those muscles and find ways to engage in a very substantive, meaningful way with individuals who may not always agree with us on policy, but can be in relationship with us so that we can learn from one another and actually be open to hearing different ideas and different positions. That's a big shift. The other piece is that these devices are rewiring our brain so that we engage emotionally. People really only have an attention span of about two seconds these days in order to, you know, engage with something. Now that poses a real challenge because we're a people of the book. <laughs> we like to do these deep substantive dives. But what happens when our own people aren't actually engaging with substance and only superficiality. This doesn't bode well for issues like hate because all of these things just exacerbate that divisiveness, create simplistic um, perspectives and actually misappropriate metaphors and analogies and try to overlay them on other complex areas of context that are completely excluded. So we're in a really different situation than we have been over the last five to 10 years. It, it really, I, I feel it. I feel it. And, and I want to, um, I want to move to an issue that is very close to home. Uh, kids, I feel like, you know, you've been doing a lot of work with, with young adults and teens over the summer, especially as the um, uh, crisis uh, between Israel and Gaza hit back in May. Um, I, I do feel like, Unfortunately, children are on the front lines of anti-Semitism in ways that their parents are not. I'm not going to walk into a bathroom at work and see a swastika. Thank God I work at CJP and I'm working from home. I'm not going to see it. But they might. Um, and kids are getting ready to go back to school, um, many for the first time in over a year. Is there a way? And if so, what is the best way to kind of inoculate, if I can use that word in, in a pandemic, Jewish kids who will be facing hatred uh, inevitably in high schools, universities, or frankly, even middle schools and elementary schools? Dan, I think you're asking a really important question. I think it's um, a question that many of us are grappling with, and I think probably most of our organizations are not prepared for. And I mean that both in terms of like large institutions like K through 12 public school to Jewish organizations. I think that even to answer that question, we have to remember that the parents right now of teenagers, for the most part, they didn't experience this form of hatred. Maybe, maybe they remember issues of anti-Semitism that were very isolated around religious identification. Maybe they remember the experience of Jews in the former Soviet Union and kind of have an understanding of what that kind of anti-Semitism looks like under fascist societies and leaders. But they themselves didn't experience an America in which they were excluded or targeted. Their parents or grandparents may have, but not them. What does that mean? It means they haven't had to actually articulate their own identity and relationship to this subject matter 
in the way that their children have to confront it. Also, if they're on social media, their social media feed looks very different than their children's. And so they probably don't even see the type of content that their children are seeing. So before we can even help the younger people, parents have to have a space in which they themselves can process this and think about how they articulate and engage in addressing it from their perspectives and then how to speak about this with their children. The other thing is that most parents have outsourced these subjects to other conversation experts. But my analogy for that is like drugs and sex, right? If you don't actually talk to your kids about those subjects, they're going to find out about it in other places. And our parents don't have the confidence, mostly some of our educators even also, to actually engage in those conversations with teens and younger. So that's a piece of this. The other piece is that majority of teens are going to face this either in real life or online. And there are different approaches for each of those contexts in terms of how you navigate it, when to engage with it, when to call in, when to call out. But they have to be more adept at it earlier and can't actually ignore it. And what we saw in the conflict in May between Israel and Hamas was that irrespective of your Jewish identity or the way in which you engage with a relationship or not with Israel, this conversation will be thrusted upon you to the point that you cannot you know, escape it. It is inevitable that you will be asked to either defend, protect, respond to, and most young people are not prepared for that. I'll give you just another example. University of Wisconsin, huge school, very large Jewish population. When is it starting school this year? On Rosh Hashanah. Now, we're living in a very woke world right now. Very woke. And yet, it doesn't register for the university administrators to think that, huh, a large percentage of our population, this is one of the most sacred holidays for them, Maybe this is not when we should be starting the first day of school, right? This is not a new fight in some ways. And yet that is still where we are, let alone vandalism, swastikas, targeting, incitement, actual physical violence. And this poses serious challenges for young people to learn how to navigate. Yeah, you know we're we're fighting that battle in in my town about uh, the second day of Rosh Hashanah, which is the start of school, um, and it's majority rules here. So Jews are always going to get outvoted if it's a straight majority vote, and that's really disturbing. But let me just say this very clearly before I ask this question: Jews are not responsible for Jew hatred. Period. We are not responsible. It's the assholes who do it who are responsible for Jew hatred. But. When we see it, if we experience it, if our kids see it, if it's at work or a college or high school, what should we do? So I agree with you. Jews are not responsible for Jew hatred. That's just clear, clear to us. I really do think especially young people see something, say something. It's that simple. You need to say something to your parents. You need to say something to your favorite teacher, to your coach, whoever is the trusted adult, your grandparent, whoever is the trusted adult, that child needs to be told, see something, experience something, you feel it in your gut, say something. Because nothing actually can get resolved if you just hold it in and don't share with someone. The other piece is that there is a balancing act, meaning there's a lot of ignorance out there. Not everyone who says something that's hateful towards Jews actually wants to murder Jews. And to think that is also absurd. So we have to find a way to educate, you know, the don't knows and the don't cares. Because the don't knows and don't cares aren't necessarily evil people. They literally don't know. It's like the simple son from the Haggadah. So it's our responsibility to educate. And I truly believe at a very young age, children can be the messenger and educator to their peers. 
So, or even older, right? So that is important for young people to know that they are empowered to be part of the process to create the positive change that is needed. So that's a piece of it. And I'm happy to share an anecdote just from my own experiences, if that's useful. The other piece is that in grownups, actually need to take a very active role, either for themselves or for their children in that education process to raise awareness and sensitize, just like we are raising awareness and becoming more sensitive about a variety of communities and marginalized voices. And we need to do that again by calling people into a conversation, trying to build bridges, explaining why these issues matter, and also Helping individuals understand that Jews can be both a community in America that have been successful, have moved up the ladder of, you know, socioeconomic mobility and a vulnerable minority. You can be both of those things at the same time. And it shouldn't feel like that's a contradiction. And they need to understand why and what is causing that sense of vulnerability. Very often, Jews are just perceived as being part of the white majority. But we know that, especially according to anti-Semites, we're anything but white. We are actually not able to become white. And so therefore, you know, that has to be explained and unpacked for a lot of individuals because they don't understand that complexity. You know, it's so funny while you were talking about uh, the importance of of education in schools. I was I was smiling because I suddenly recalled something from my childhood, which I had kind of forgotten about, which was in I want to say first or second grade. Um, a fellow student of mine had drawn a swastika, and and I remember the teacher grabbing it, putting it, dragging him and the drawing to me to my desk, slapping it down on my desk, and going, "How do you think it makes her feel?" And, I think that was my first introduction to educating an, another, a fellow child on, yes, this, not great. Don't do this again. But it was very, um, I just had forgotten that moment and how someone had been made to uh, come over to my desk and I explained, you know, I, I was the example of a person they had hurt, a real person who they knew, who their actions could hurt. Um, it, it removed it from an abstract of, I'm just drawing something I know I'm not supposed to draw to, okay, you're, you're drawing something that has a real meaning behind it. And I think you're totally right in that so many people have no idea what they're saying or doing is inherently anti-Semitic. And we're going to talk about that in, in a few minutes, actually, um, specifically about social media and, and Israel. Uh, but I also want to, before we get to that, talk about the reticence that people have right now to be visibly Jewish or identify themselves openly as Jews. I know several people who are just not comfortable with it. I can't say I blame them for, for that feeling. It's uh, There's a lot of fear out there. I can't really blame anybody for this, but it makes me so angry that they are being forced to obfuscate who they actually are uh, for safety purposes. And, and many people can't obfuscate who they are. So there, I want to acknowledge that as well. But what do I do or what do, does anyone who has this abundant rage, uh, how do we direct that anger to something that's actually productive for the safety of our community and other marginalized communities? It's a great question, Miriam. You know, again, I look back historically and what I say, first I say on a human level, I empathize the fear. I get it. But I also then look back at the historical and say, hiding your identity never solves the problem. Meaning when Jews in the you know, 18th, 19th century are converting to Christianity, they're doing it so they, they can be accepted by the host society in which they are living. And then when you have this racialization of Jew hatred, it becomes very clear that converting won't solve the problem because you're still going to be identified as a Jew because your DNA is immutable. Who you are as a person means you are still Jewish, irrespective of if you left the religion. And that's also how the Nazis understood it. 
right? The Nazis didn't care if you lit Shabbat candles. The Nazis didn't care if you kept kosher. You had a Jewish family member. You knew where you were headed. So I understand, like I truly understand the individuals who don't want to identify publicly as Jewish. And I want to say to them at the same time, it doesn't keep you safe. It doesn't protect you. And I want them to have the moral courage to be proud of who they are, irrespective of the haters out there. Like all the more so stand proudly for your Jewishness and your Jewish identity. So I I think that really matters. And I don't even know if I answered your question properly here, but but the reason I say it really matters is because what we do specifically as grownups, also young people are looking at as models. And I can't right. emphasize enough that piece because when they see, whether it's a parent, an older sibling, a teacher, a, you know, a religious leader, a communal leader, you know, slowly putting that Magen David into their shirt, right? Or putting the hat on over their kippah. It's a clear message. And one that makes me nervous because those are the models they are looking to, to know how to respond, engage, and walk through the world. Dan and I often just turn to each other, or rather, we don't turn to each other because we're not in person. We message each other every day and we say, the Jews are tired. The Jews are tired. And it's because we are so tired. We know that hate towards Jews is never going to go away, ever. And part of the exhaustion is feeling that we are mostly in it alone, cyclically, throughout history. It's us alone. Um, Is this too pessimistic of a view or not nearly pessimistic enough? So I think, uh, you know, it's probably some healthy combination that we need. We need to be, I think very aware of what history has taught us. And history has shown us that too often there aren't enough people of other political positions, ethnic compositions, religious identifications that are willing to stand in support of and in protection of Jews. I mean, think about the righteous Gentiles, those who were incredible, but how many weren't? right? How many weren't? And what difference would it have made? Millions of lives different. So I'm not naive to know that that's hard because to do that requires also upstander qualities. It means standing and swimming up against the stream and the tide of the cultural zeitgeist to align yourself with the group that is being demonized on multiple fronts. And labeled inaccurately, but labeled as being oppressive, imperialist, racist, right? And so that's very hard, particularly, as I said, when you're living in a world of simplicity, to buck that and to say, that's wrong. So we have to build those relationships because you also don't expect Jews to solve anti-Semitism, just like you don't expect people of color to solve racism. Right. Meaning you have to have long term systemic approaches with a variety of individuals who understand these issues in order to create sustainable long term change. So do we need other people? A thousand percent. We need a lot of non-Jews to understand these issues of all different backgrounds, because we Jews cannot do it alone. And I don't think that means anti-Semitism ends. It's never going to end. It is always here to stay. But do I think that we need to make it socially unacceptable? A thousand percent, right? So I take a very um, centrist approach to this. Jews better not expect anyone else to stand up for them because you will sorely um, be upset and frustrated if you look behind you and think that there are going to be others who are there because history has shown us too often they aren't. And we cannot at all forego building those allyships and bridges between other communities because we need them and they need us. It's reciprocal. It's not asymmetrical. So we need some healthy combination of the two. It is evident that when Israel is in conflict with Hamas and Gaza, anti-Semitism against Jews here in America increases. 
A recent ADL study found that more than 60% of American Jews had experienced um, some form of Jew hatred in the past few months since the most recent conflict. Many well-meaning people who are concerned about Palestinian rights do slip into incitement against Jews. Sometimes they are aware that they're doing it, and sometimes they are really unaware. Um, and one recent high-profile example I can think of uh, from a celebrity is the actor Mark Ruffalo, who has always supported Palestinian causes, but he apologized for a tweet um, because he recognized or was informed, it was brought to his attention, that what that particular tweet was doing was actually creating fueling violence against Jews here in America as opposed to helping Palestinian causes. And I don't believe it was his intent to put anything anti-Jew out there, but he was recognizing that he had done it by stating that he had made a mistake. And immediately much of Twitter jumped down his throat for his retraction, but I give him that credit. It can be very difficult, especially when it's your friends, your family. Um, to communicate why it is that something they said, something they posted, isn't just critical, legitimately critical of policies they may did not agree with uh, regarding Israel's treatment of the Palestinians, but rather veers right into anti-Jewish tropes. How do we navigate these relationships, both online and in person, when it is so complex and people don't necessarily know, have the knowledge, as you've said, to understand these delineations? Miriam, it's it's a great question. And it's all the more so complicated when we live right now in a culture that engages for play, for fun and public shaming and cancel culture. So all the more so this becomes compounded as an issue. And I would say that, you know, part of the challenge is helping individuals understand that we do not live in these binaries. So what do I mean by that? I mean very simply that these worlds are worlds in which it's not simply good and evil. That is just not the world in which we are living. That individuals actually um, can hold a complex position in which we can say, again, I deeply understand the vulnerability of the Jewish people. And not only do I understand the vulnerability of the Jewish people, but I also understand that there is a desire for Palestinians to be safe, for Palestinians to have a safe haven like Jews have, to have their own state, to have viable leadership that doesn't use them as political pawns to be free of terrorist authoritarian institutions like Hamas. And these things don't have to be, you know, an either or. And we actually have to promote that complexity to say it's not one or the other. Meaning I deeply care about a strong, secure, healthy Israel. And that doesn't at all mean that I don't care about Palestinians. It actually means I do care about Palestinians. So it can't be one or the other juxtaposed. That's one. In terms of actually engaging in the conversation, if it's online, my first thought always is, do you actually know the person? If you don't know the person, don't feed the trolls, right? Meaning if it's an influencer, it wasn't, um, you know, people writing to Mark Ruffalo via DM or, you know, putting their little message that made him all of a sudden have this light bulb moment. It was his friends around him behind the scenes who had an impact that led him to the change in conversation. So why I say that is you actually need to get offline and in conversation with your friends, with your peers, in order to be able to have some real exchange of ideas. The other piece is, and we saw this, is that it's not about trying to um, put forth talking points. That's not going to work. First of all, most people will always be scrambling for the next talking point, And a little bit of pushback will actually lead them to just feel like they can't engage in the conversation. 
So my recommendation is to come from a place of authenticity and ask real questions. So for example, if I see a friend or an acquaintance post something, I would write to that individual, you know, via that platform and say, I saw you posted free Palestine. I'd actually be interested in what you mean when you say free Palestine, because when I see that, I have a very different response. And can we have a conversation so that I can learn where you're coming from? And are you open to hearing where I'm coming from and why this is challenging for me? And that actually is not, it's not that hard to do. It sounds like it takes a little bit of like, energy or like ability to to do that. And, you know, it does. But by asking the questions and being open to actually engaging in a real conversation, listen, I may not change my friend's perspective, but I do think I will make them more aware of why that slogan or terminology is loaded and the impact it has on people who aren't ascribing to that terminology. So I deeply believe in asking questions because I think in a, and not to play gotcha, like that's not the point, but to really ask the questions, to move the conversation so that people can actually hear one another and be engaged on a much more human level than rather that emotional divisive, you know, desire that we see. You know, what's interesting here is that I had a colleague of mine who during, um, during earlier this summer said to me, I'm, I'm really struggling. I have these, a friend who I'm really close with, but he's posting all these things and I can't get him to listen to what I'm trying to tell him about why some of the wording he's using isn't actually, you know, it's, it's actually an anti-Semitic wording. It's, it's not what he thinks. He's not saying what he thinks he's saying, but this person was very dismissive of her and was not listening, assumed that he knew exactly where she was coming from, her perspective, um, and and assumed that he knew more than her, which, first of all, mansplainy. Second of all, but but what I actually said to this, this colleague of mine, I said, and now you find out this is how you lose friends, because I have lost many a friend who I have agreed with them on 99.99% of everything politically progressive, um, things that I, I believe are true, but when they slide into intentionally or just because they do not know into blood libel or, or something like that, where I just simply cannot, and they will not understand, um, how that differs from actual real substantive, uh, criticism, you do kind of have to give up on those people in, in my opinion, because otherwise it becomes a drain on you and you just become more and more isolated and miserable. Was I wrong to give my colleague the, just the heads up that you might lose this person. It may not be worth it to put in this emotional labor. No. So Miriam, I totally agree. So, you know, my inclination is first to call in as I'm saying and ask those questions, but when it becomes obvious that they're dismissive or not interested in that honest engagement, one has to ask themselves, for what purpose and I'm, am I trying to hold on to this you know, relationship or whatever it may be? I can tell you, for me, it becomes very clear fairly quickly you know, who I'm going to stay close with and who doesn't need to be part of my you know, inner circle. And I'm okay with that, but we also have to remember we're not of a generation in which um, that sense of FOMO, right? That fear of missing out permeates us in the same way as it does a younger generation. And so doing that for a younger generation, I have to tell you, I am seeing it is much, much harder. So I'll give you an example. I had several teenagers say to me in presentations, you know, this individual, whoever it is, I want to be their ally. For whatever reason, whether it's because of, you know, ethnicity, you know, gender identity, sexual orientation, whatever it is, I, you know, need to show allyship with this individual. And I said, I understand that. But what happens when this individual is, you know, flirting with anti-Semitism? Do you still feel you need to be prostrating yourself to that individual just to have that sense of moral purity for yourself, when you are then sacrificing your own particularism, and they don't ever have to sacrifice their particularism, 
Now, that's very hard for young people to understand. I have to say it's probably hard for others to understand, but definitely young people. But for me, I have very serious clarity about that. And um, that's not easy. That's not easy. But we have to help, it goes back to that moral courage, help others understand why they need to be proud of who they are and their identity and that their identity shouldn't be sacrificed because of someone else's identity. So anti-Israel sentiment can often be tied directly to Jew hatred, Rachel, as you mentioned earlier. And this has become something of a wedge in our community when really we should be speaking out with one voice against issues of Jew hatred because it affects every Jew. Most recently, a few left-leaning organizations opted not to take part in a march against anti-Semitism in D.C. Attendance was initially, I think, expected to be a lot higher than it was. Around 2,000 people showed up. The Washington Post said a few hundred. I disagree with that from the photos, but whatever. Um, How can we work together across these partisan ideological divides against what is an existential threat of Jew hatred around the world and here at home when we're fighting with each other about Israeli policy? Dan, I, I honestly believe this is one of the biggest challenges right now the Jewish community has to confront. And I think that what we have seen over the last I think five to seven years is that Israel has become a wedge issue. It's no longer a rallying cry in a bipartisan way. And I don't even mean just, you know, only in terms of politics, it's broader than that, but it is now a wedge issue the way abortion is a wedge issue. And that actually is really bad for Jews. It's bad for Jews in this country because it's this sort of divide and conquer approach. It's bad for Israel, period. And I think um, there are many Israeli politicians who understand that. There are some who leveraged that for different reasons, but now I think it's understood how troubling it actually is. I think that there has to be just a writ large recalibration here that when we see Criticism of Israeli policy, we all know it's not anti-Semitism. We know every Israeli, whether they're Jewish, whether they're Arab, no matter if they're Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, Ethiopian, right? Whomever they are, engage in criticism of Israeli policy, just like every American I know engages in criticism of American policy. It doesn't right, mean- like The last four years was me Hello? just criticizing America. Right, and it doesn't mean you're- unpatriotic. It's actually an exhibit of your patriotism because you are so deeply connected and invested in that place and that you desire to make it better. Now, we can all have different conceptions of how to make it better, but it doesn't mean you're burning a flag because you hate this country. So there has to be a recalibration around understanding that. I also just want to say, in terms of anti-Zionism, the way it is discussed in the mainstream conversation, that form of anti-Zionism, which is the framing of does Israel have a right to exist? And the answer is no. For me, that is anti-Semitism. And I'm very clear about that because I've been to too many academic lectures in which it, be, it serves as a guise, a mask, to suggest, oh, it's just criticism. There is no criticism about it. Meaning I'm all for criticism. Where should the green line be? What do you do with settlements? How can Israel engage in having its um, power in a morally um, appropriate manner? How do you deal with security? Like those are real questions. These are not the questions. The questions now in this anti-Zionist framework are, does Israel have a right to exist? The answer is no. It's a white colonialist imperialist state. And therefore, Jews have to actually be removed from this equation and have no right to organize themselves as a collective who desires self-determination as part of territorial sovereignty. Well, that's a that's a non-starter for me. Now, if someone wants to engage in a complex, nuanced discussion about the way in which anti-Zionism has existed along the spectrum of possibilities within Jewish history, that's kosher. That's a different conversation. But that is not the conversation 
Rashida Tlaib is having. That is not the conversation that David Duke is having, right? Like there's a difference. So we have to understand that. We have to remove this American lens that has been placed on and overlaid on the Israel-Palestine conversation, meaning this conflict is about a lot of things. It's about religion. It's about nationalism. It's about real estate. It's about narratives. But one thing I can tell you with certainty that it is not about is about race. It's not about black and white. Like that is not part of the equation. It never has been. So when that becomes the lens through which this conversation is refracted, and then you see language like Jews and Zionists are part of a white supremacist idea, someone should be asking themselves, wait a minute, this language from an American conversation is being misappropriated and utilized for a very clear political agenda. So when you see social justice movements in this country start to do that, it should raise a red flag. That's that critical thinking I was talking about. And the American Jewish community has to get on board and organize to understand this. Because if we have within our own community, the leaders say, well, I don't agree with Israeli policy on X. And so therefore, I don't think that I can attend this rally again. Just like it doesn't matter if you're traditionally observant, the anti-Semites are going to target you. They don't care if you like Israel, they're still going to target you. So get on board to understand what the urgency is and the threat that's facing us today. There definitely does feel to be a trend and, and it was on social media quite a bit over the last few months. And, and I had to take a step back from social media um, because of this very flat uh, view that if you did not, because it was through an entirely American lens. And that was so odd about it is that we were just projecting, you know, we were, do America was dominating the conversation the way America dominates the world. And couldn't people see how we were just putting American uh, conflict, American problems onto a completely different problem. Um, and, but there seemed to be no way to separate these things in the eyes and opinions of so many people, which was a very difficult and frustrating part of it. Um, but one one interesting aspect of this, one nauseating aspect, I should say, is seeing a person who has expressed anti-Jewish sentiment or tried, for example, to use the Holocaust to bolster a political argument or viewpoint that they're trying to push, say that they can't possibly be, um, you know, Jew haters because they love and support Israel. Like, for example, Marjorie Taylor Greene, our favorite, who famously claimed that the Rothschilds using a space laser set fire to California a few years back. Right. You know, makes total sense. Yet she she's like, no, 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 no. I love Jews. How could I not? I love Israel. So she's hiding behind her alleged, you know, quote unquote support, which of Israel, which I think is politically expedient for her. But she's hiding behind that and saying, I can't possibly be doing anything against Jews here in America or causing their lives to be difficult because I support Israel. How do we handle people with this very messed up ideology of, of defending by saying, I love Israel? Look, I think that partly the answer has to come that from each political camp. Right. So meaning if you're a Republican, then you need to be able as a Republican, not just to denounce what's happening by some Democrats, but look at your own political party to call in or call out as appropriate and raise awareness and educate. Just like Democrats need to be looking within because it can't just be shooting the bows across the aisle. And that's not going to ultimately change what's happening internally within those political communities. The other piece is that the Holocaust, when it's used in this metaphor way, is always going to be problematic, just in general. And to hide behind, you know, one's love of Israel, yet still harbor traditional anti-Semitic tropes, doesn't make you better. <laughs> it just means you're more ignorant. And that has to be addressed, right? It has to be addressed. And part of that, again, is that 
the majority of people do not understand how Jew hatred has mutated over time. They really just don't get that. And they don't understand it. And it has to be unpacked for them. And again, it exacerbates Israel as a wedge issue. And that is not at all healthy for Jews or the larger conversation. Because the conversations about Israel in this country, specifically around non-Jewish conversations, is about foreign policy. Remember, this is a region in which it truly is um, an outlier in a sea of turmoil. It doesn't mean it's perfect, but it matters that Israel and the United States have a good relationship. And it matters how it's going to address nuclear issues with Iran and the way in which Israel engages with other countries in the region, like Saudi Arabia, in order to address those issues with Iran, right? Like this is much bigger than just like the Jews. And so we have to be able to help people zoom out to really understand these issues. So you describe yourself as a scholar warrior in the fight against anti-Semitism. What does that mean to you right now in this current context? So, you know, I joke that when I grow up, I want my business cards to say, you know, Rachel Fish, scholar warrior. I, I don't need another title. That is who I am. And when I say that, it means that I have spent my life and will continue to spend my life becoming as educated as humanly possible about these issues but for the purpose of being able to engage in a way that is accessible and digestible to a variety of audiences, Jews and non-Jews, so that they are more aware of and sensitive about the urgency, the uniqueness, the realities that Jews have experienced, continue to experience. And I see in that conversation that just being academically oriented is not sufficient, but also going out only looking for fights and being a pugilist isn't, you know, only sufficient. You need to meld the two. And so that's why I see myself as a scholar warrior, and hopefully I can aspire to live up to that. Well, Dr. Fish, thank you so much for joining us today on The Vibe of the Tribe and talking through these painful yet very important issues with us. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for the important conversation. Thank you to everyone out there for listening. If you liked this episode, be sure to rate and review The Vibe of the Tribe wherever you listen to podcasts and follow at Jewish Boston on social media. Take care and be safe, everybody. 